Start. Start now from the beginning. All right. My name is David Zucker, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the Towers Complex. Right in front of, in front of you. We have two policies here. Our first one is one pool at a time, and second, no personal attack. This restaurant is not in business for its health, and so you need to order either dinner or something else to eat or drink. Those are three dollar tuition charge will be collected. Each of you go to a college major trade expense. Format is as follows. First of all, we are going to have uh, Charlie, our coordinator, Charlie Paydock, will introduce uh, the upcoming topics, upcoming programs, and then we will open the floor to announcements of neighborhood or community interest. No speeches, they must be announcements. And I will introduce a nice speaker who will talk for about an hour or so on the topic in the evening. And after that, we will have questions and answers. And this is like Jeopardy. All questions must be in that form, no speeches. Can we come to the rebuttals? Our moderator, Tim, will portion out the time per person. Right in front of you, Dave. We'll portion out the time per person. And uh, if we talk for whatever the time allotted is, three minutes, five minutes, whatever it is, or any topic that you want. We would prefer that you rebut the speaker, but you don't have to do that. And then the speaker will get the last word, and then we have to be out of here by a quarter to eight because the restaurant closes at eight o'clock. All right, there, Charlie, take it away. All right, Charlie, you're up. All right, welcome to meeting number 3,722 of the college complexes, the playground for people who think. As usual, I would recommend right at the center top of our main website. There's information on joining and signing up. We have two email groups, a Google email group and a meetup group. Uh, there's no traffic on this. One or two notices of upcoming topics. It only takes uh, an email to subscribe. Uh, also, I have like to request everyone who is attending by Zoom to please put a red X over your microphone at least during the presentation, so as not to disturb the program. Please do that now. And I must ask the people in attendance at the restaurant to please keep down crosstalk at least during the presentation because it is picked up by the microphone. Although I'm not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On July the 1st, I myself will start off with our, we've got two independent state programs. I have put together my list of what I think are the 10 most important historical sites in the United States that everyone should visit. So, and you will be open to suggest one or more of your own that you think uh, are, are superior to the ones, if possible, that I recommend. Nevertheless, that's on July 1st. On uh, July 8th, we'll be visited by none other than George Washington himself, a founding father, uh, who will be here, uh, at least on Zoom, to answer any or all questions you may have about uh, starting out know, the United States. On uh, July 15th, we're going to listen to a, a, a radio recording, a dramatic reading of the uh, letter sent by Frederick Douglass on the 10 year anniversary of his having escaped slavery. So we'll open the, the, open the microphone for discussion on the issue of uh, pre prejudicial issues. So that's July 15th. We're trying something new here. On uh, July 22nd, uh, Reverend Charlie Earp will be returning. Uh, he's an advocate of uh, the presidency, recently announced of Cornell West, is seeking to become president of the United States, and we'll hear uh, why we should vote for Cornell. On July 29th, our own Jennifer Barton uh, will have, is putting together a uh, half a dozen so poems, which he calls the Poetry of Change. 
So we'll see, uh, listen to these uh, um, uh, uh, productions of um, uh, Jonathan um, uh, regarding uh, what needs to be done in the United States. On August, uh, Jian Lee from our satellite campus has put together a program on what she is, she's arranged about some of the issues concerning artificial intelligence, which is slowly being introduced uh, on the internet. Uh, so we'll be looking at the uh, challenges and the opportunities that she maintains are there. That leaves open three open- yeah, That ugly and, sack of shit. Then we've got a control, uh, we've got an unwelcome visitor. I, I know, it's gonna be hard to find him though. That's all right, Charlie, go ahead, keep going, please. Okay, on August the 5th, uh, okay, we covered that. That leaves three dates open in August the 12th, the 19th and the 26th. Contact me if you'd like to be put on the schedule. Thank you. Okay, Dave, go ahead. Who's our speaker? All right, first of all, are there any more announcements? I hear you and I have one. You are also. Please use the speaker, Dave. Okay, right, right in front of you. Andy has some. All right, Andy, you have an announcement. Before you get up here, I also have one, namely, you are requested to silence or turn off your cell phones and other electronics. All right, Andy, go ahead. I like to make this announcement at the very start while everybody is alert. And tonight's talk is going to be on uh, climate change, apparently. Um, I'd like to uh, point, I mean, bring your attention to two books that are classics. One is called How to Talk to a Science Denier. That's one of the premier problems of our age is people don't want to think about something that they think they might have to get involved in if they recognize it. The other book is edited by Greta Thunberg. Anybody involved in uh, climate change knows who Greta Thunberg is. This book is called The Climate Book, and it's got uh, testimony from all kinds of different scientists from all over the world, the best thinkers. Get the fuck out of here, bitch! Yep, that's another troll, troll apparently. That's why uh, we like to do it in person here. For those of you that uh, haven't seen this book, it's called The Climate Book. If you only had time to get one book on climate change out of the hundreds that are out there right now, this would be the one I would recommend. So thank you very much. That's The Climate Book by Greta Thunberg. Okay, Dave, go ahead and introduce and... Uh... Yeah. All right, our speaker tonight is Dr. Guy McPherson, who will be addressing us on Zoom. And he's going to be talking about climate change, something that we all need to know. Give it up, please, for Dr. Guy McPherson. All right. Got more. All right, Guy, the performance yours. All right, Guy, go ahead and get started. Taylor. Okay, if I can figure out how to share my screen, I'll be right with you. Right on the bottom. Here, see the dots? I guess, and again, again I'd like everybody to uh, mute themselves on Zoom except for our speaker. But screen. Maybe that one? Yep, there you go. Um, which one are you that's still having trouble with us? Go to basic. That's it. You just want this one. Oh, God. We still got a lot. Guy, give me a minute, okay? Mm -hmm. You're still. Um... Just click it. Go save sound. I don't have too much for video. Yeah. 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 Pardon, you need to speak in order to be seen. Okay, are you, are you, all right, we got you up on screen there. You, you shared it. You're on, you're on the screen now. You can go ahead, guy. Got it. Yes. Just, just working on the next step. Okay. Um, home and then you're going to, you're at PowerPoint, right? Yes. 
Yes, and I'm trying to figure out how to show you the PowerPoint. They're looking. Um, they're seeing it. That's what they're seeing. That's all. Just go. Slide through. show. Slide uh, slide show in the middle there. Where your browser's at, go to slideshow, then play from start all the way to the left. Okay, you got it? Something like that? Yes, we can see it now, but uh, you may want to do full screen. Because we can see your notes and everything. You might just want to go full screen on it. Uh, Presenter view. Pre, uh, you want to do, uh, you want to do, uh, not present of you. Yeah. yeah. Play from start. There we go. Get all your friends around. Call every friend you have right now. All of them. Invite them over for a party. When they all turn up, pour out sparkling water. Pour it all out. Pour it out. Why don't you put people in the waiting room? That okay. was not me, by the way. <laughs> well, okay, the two are talking in the background. You know how to mute yourself. All right. I'm going to talk about abrupt irreversible climate change. And because I did not know about abrupt irreversible climate change until after I left active service at the University of Arizona, I didn't reach that conclusion until June 20th, 2012. So I'd been away from campus life for a few years. These are some of the consequences of abrupt climate change that we are seeing in evidence right now. I'm going to pose 10 different questions. No need to write these down because I will take them one at a time, starting with the most simple of questions, I think, for this group. What is anthropogenic climate change? I'm going to draw all of my answers from the peer review. Only a cat owning bitch would complain to the police about a fucking joke. Fine, you're upset you lost your cat. Fair enough, you have the joke. We got him. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Di, you're up. You're up. Uh... Apparently, nobody in this group has a taser, so we can take care of those kinds of interruptions. Uh, it's it's my apologies, but I'm trying my best to do it. So go ahead, please. Anyway, sorry about that. So all of my responses will be drawn from the peer-reviewed literature or from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which itself draws from the peer-reviewed literature. In this example, I'm using the IPCC to describe what anthropogenic climate change is. And I think it's been up there long enough that people can have had a chance to read it now. Cat owners. Cat owners are liberals. Cat owners believe in hate speech. Cat owners are Democrats. Cat owners are dickheads. Wow. You're trying to get rid of these guys. I'm sorry. They just keep coming up again all the time. Who's the waiting room? Can, can I talk about cat owners? Yeah, yeah, that'd be a distraction. Go ahead. I, I'd, like, I'd like to point out that common greenhouse gases, most of us know about carbon dioxide, the most common, most abundant greenhouse gas is water vapor, which has a very, very rapid return time. Methane is also considerably more powerful than carbon dioxide. And there are 39 others that I know about besides the ones on this list. So that's anthropogenic climate change. The next question was habitat. And I'm drawing here from the peer-reviewed peer paper in Wildlife Society Bulletin. Habitat includes the resources and conditions present in an area that produce occupancy, including survival and reproduction. Obviously, habitat is organism specific because what one organism requires for its survival is different from what another organism requires for its survival. Moving on to civilizations, the creation and maintenance of civilizations requires abundant growth, storage, and the ability to distribute grains. And this paper is from the Journal of Political Economy. And they are referring to civilization when they, when they write hierarchy arose as a result of the shift to dependence on appropriable cereal grains. The cereal grains in question here are rice, wheat, maize, commonly called corn in the United States, and soy. So then, what is required to grow, store, and distribute abundant grains to do that a large scale? 
that requires a cool, stable climate. And those kinds of conditions arose on Earth coming out of the last ice age some 10,000 years ago when the planet planetary temperature stabilized a few thousand years ago. There's considerable controversy about whether that was five or six or 10 years ago, but we'll just say a few thousand years ago, which led to the creation of several civilizations, the likes of which had not been previously seen in the very long existence of our species on the planet. So apparently a cool and stable climate is required to grow grains and therefore sustain civilizations. The, I think that most of us know that the Industrial Revolution began in the mid 1700s, it started in Great Britain, at which point machine advances had been made that allowed manufactured goods to be greatly, the, the production of manufactured goods to be greatly increased. And there, is a, there are a few examples that are given there that carried us into the mass production experience that we're all familiar with now. The El Nino Southern Oscillation is poised to bring a, tra traumatic, a dramatic increase in temperature and greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. You can think of the ocean as something of a battery. The battery stores heat and it stores greenhouse gases. We're in the midst of a triple dip La Nina, which has never been observed before in the history of recording El Nino and La Nina events, which goes back some 75 years. The El Nino Southern Oscillation releases those greenhouse gases and the heat from the ocean into the atmosphere where they are able to have profound impacts on the quality of human life. In fact, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration announced by a press release on May 11th, 2023, that the triple dip El Nino was giving way to a rapidly transitioning El Nino Southern Oscillation. The El Nino Southern Oscillation blog published by NOAA announced by a blog post on June 8th, 2023, so just a couple of weeks ago, that the El Nino Southern Oscillation has arrived there's a 56% chance it will be a strong event and an 84% chance it will be at least a moderate event. This is a, a bit of information that should be of considerable concern to those of us who know anything. Why is your lazy ass not doing the right thing and start picking and cleaning shit up? If you're sitting there going, that's sexist. Well, it's sexist for me to fucking pay for everything, isn't it, you fucking bimbo? But that's fine. This is the whole world we live in now, double standards. It's okay for the masculine thing, but it's not okay for you to do the feminine thing. It's bullshit. Women should clean. Go ahead and keep presenting. Yeah, I keep presenting. <laughs> I'm, I'm going. Next question, how important is the rate of environmental change? And apparently this is something that is well understood by ecologists, but almost nobody else. The rate of environmental change constitutes a serious threat to the persistence of populations, species, and communities. And from the peer-reviewed OICUS publication, which focuses on ecological research, a rapid rate of environmental change, quote, restricts the ability of organisms, populations, or communities to respond. In other words, ecological entity, entities, including human organisms and the ecosystems we find ourselves embedded within, would have difficulty responding to rapid rates of environmental change. The feminists who hate us and call us toxic, the second they have trouble, they'll call a police officer. Do you think they want a feminist male to turn up or a man like me and you? They need us and they use us. But the second we have an opinion, the second I decide to voice and talk about the things that we talk about, explain our points of view, they want to cancel us. They don't want us to speak. They just want us to defend them, build the railroads, build the roads, be the workhorses, be the slaves. And they think we're not allowed a point of view. Well, they made a fucking mistake because I, like every great leader throughout history, charge first before my army, cavalry charge at the enemy. You can cancel me. I'm about to pave the road for every other man out here with an opinion who's going to get canceled. I'll show you where to fucking go. Let's get ready to rumble.
when I had the profile picture that looked like anything. All right. Well, had a picture of two people talking. The rate of environmental change projected by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, outstrips the ability of vertebrates to adapt by 10,000 times. We've known this for 10 years this coming Monday. So that's really important because human animals happen to be vertebrates. Mammals can't keep up either, as reported in the prestigious Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And tardigrades, the go-to species for people who can't believe that all life on Earth could possibly go extinct, tardigrades almost certainly will not survive. Scientific reports is in the renowned Nature series of publications. And this paper has just come out about three years ago. I'd like to show a small film clip here that demonstrates the importance of envir environmental change. Everybody knows about playing with dominoes, but what you may not know is that a domino can knock over another domino, which is about one and a half times larger. So what I have here is a chain of dominoes. Each one is one and a half times larger than the previous one. And the smallest domino is about five they want you eating high, the bugs. They want you at home, sick. unable to pay your bills, afraid to speak up. Them. And I am here to save you. 18 modern wealth creation methods, plus new things we could never teach before inside of infrastructure, which is, exists completely and utterly outside domino. of the matrix. The real world is here. It weighs about 100 pounds ugh, and is more than a meter tall. Ready? Boom. That was 13 dominoes. If I had 29 dominoes, the last domino would be as tall as the Empire State Building. I think this short video accurately displays what happens when we have excellent They looked at us and thought they have too much power, too much influence. Let's hit them with the most powerful weapon we have. Let's cancel them. Let's close all their accounts. Let's make them banish. Let's, let's destroy their influence. That's the biggest bullet they have. Imagine shooting a man with your last bullet and he stands there. I'll tell you. Unfazed. Do I look canceled? And uh, find out what the hell's going on instead of just trying to keep interrupting us. You know, it is kind of rude to do this stuff like this. But anyway, you're gone. I suggest that the host learn how to use the mute all button immediately when that yeah, happens. We have done that yep. a few times, and then we get the speaker. All right. Anyway, um, I'm sorry about the interruptions again. Obviously, we got a good connect. We got a good speaker, and I know you guys want to hear him. I'm sorry about the trolls. Uh, my equipment's a little bit crazy, but please just uh, go ahead. I do apologize again for the trolls. Go ahead, sir. We, uh, I'm sure we've all heard about the importance of two degrees C, specifically above the 1750 baseline. 1750 being a relatively broad range of a, of a mean of times. As I referred earlier to the Industrial Revolution beginning in the 1750s, the mid-1750s. Well, the precursor to the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, was the Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases. And in their final year of existence, they indicate that, indicated that beyond one degree C may elicit rapid, unpredictable, and nonlinear responses that could lead to extensive ecosystem damage. In other words, the advisory group on greenhouse gases recognized that 1C was a serious threat to ecosystems and their ability to respond. And I'm not sure how we lost track of that when an economist of all people decided that 2C was the better number. In fact, David Spratt, climate science speaker and writer, said in his presentation in October 2014 that self-reinforcing feedback loops have been triggered at one half of a degree C above the 1750 baseline. Now, this is pretty important because it only takes one self-reinforcing feedback loop to be reported, to be discovered, before climate change is irreversible. Indeed, 
when the IPCC was created, and, and that process took a few years through the Reagan administration, Princeton and Professor Michael Oppenheimer pointed out on the Environmental Defense Fund blog that the US government saw the creation of the IPCC as a way to prevent activism. In fact, he points out that the IPCC was designed to fail with respect to significant changes that would produce positive results at the societal level. And sure enough, I would argue that the IPCC has indeed failed and continues along that wayward path. That notwithstanding, despite never taking the precautionary principle into play, the IPCC concluded in their October 8th, 2018 report, global warming of 1.5 degrees, that the human-driven change... Most of you are lazy. In fact, I'd say basically all of you are lazy. You don't understand what work is. You don't understand what work ethic is. You don't understand the ethos of conquer Earth. You don't have fire blood. You don't wake up to go piss at 3.32 a.m. and go, I'm not going back to sleep because I want to make some fucking money. So you're all lazy. You're all arrogant. Because when I sit here as the richest person who's ever fucking wasted his time talking to your fucking dumb ass and tells you what to do, you don't fucking listen to me. I feel like that some days myself. The, the IPCC and the peer-reviewed literature they cite indicates that even abrupt geophysical events do not approach current rates of human-driven change. As nearly as the IPCC can tell, and the IPC is, is, is incredibly scientifically conservative, the planet is undergoing the most rapid rate of environmental change in planetary history. This is kind of a big deal because it's the rate of environmental change that dictates whether species, communities, ecological assemblages will continue to persist. In a follow-up report less than a year later, the IPCC concluded in their special report on the ocean and cryosphere and a changing climate that climate change was in fact irreversible and they attributed this irreversible nature. Well, to take, you know, maybe he's wrong about your broke. How can I be wrong when you're in the poor category and I'm in the rich category? The, this special report on the ocean and cryosphere indicated that an overheated ocean was responsible for the irreversibility of climate change. And obviously with a El Nino headed our way and gonna release that heat from the ocean. This is a cause for particular concern. However, we are beyond one, beyond 2C that, that I read every day, we need to be concerned about crossing the one and a half degree Rubicon. We're, we're beyond two at this point, as Andrew Glickson points out on his October 9th, 2020 book, The Event Horizon. And this is in fact, the most of the, the abstract for chapter five of that book, you can easily find it online. And he indicates that we are beyond 2C, which only mattered because one and a half or 2C drives self-reinforcing feedback loops, take the situation out of human hands. That's already been done as even the stunningly conservative IPCC reported with that special report on the ocean and, and cryosphere. And it gets worse, of course. On page 32 of, of his book, The Diversity of Life, E.O. Wilson wrote that humanity has, humanity has initiated the sixth great extinction spasm, rushing to eternity a large fraction of our fellow species in a single generation. So we're already in the midst of a mass extinction event, and we have been for more than 30 years. Again, one of the things I hear almost every day is we have to make sure we don't enter a mass extinction event. This, by the way, is at least the ninth, not the sixth. Upon release of this paper in Science Advances on June 20th, a few years after E.O. Wilson pointed out that we were in the midst of a mass extinction event, 
Her, the lead author, Gerardo Ceballos, said life would take many millions of years to recover, and our species itself would likely disappear early on. We would be among the first species to disappear as a result of this mass extinction event. In addition, Giovanni Strona and Corey Bradshaw, in their November 13th, 2018 paper in Scientific Reports, again, part of the prestigious nature series, indicated that not only would our species likely go extinct, but all life on Earth would go extinct during extreme environment, environmental change. And according to this paper, extreme environmental change would be a result of a five to six degree temperature rise over a span of centuries. Bear in mind, we're already above two, and the rate of environmental change is critically important, far more important than any particular number we happen to reach along the way. One of the things I read almost every day is we, we can't afford to go above one and a half. We can't afford to go above two because at three or four or five or six or whatever number somebody is making up, we're likely to go extinct. Well, it has a lot more to do with the rate of environmental change than it does with any particular number. Strona and Bradshaw do point out that a rogue, seemingly desert Earth wandering across the universe would still have some tiny chance of blooming again under some lucky and unlikely circumstances. So if that's the hope you're depending upon, I think we're in real trouble. In fact, I think we're in real trouble. An ice-free Arctic Ocean will produce the fastest rate of environmental change in the history of our species. Such an event was projected to occur in 2016, plus or minus three years, in the renowned Annual Review of Earth and Planetary Sciences, published in 2012. How renowned? The Annual Review series publishes one volume per year. So everything fits into that single volume or it doesn't get published. The ice-free Arctic Ocean was predicted to occur by Professor Jennifer McKinnon in 2002 and by, by Professor James Anderson in 2023, that's this year. And the best news I could possibly give in a presentation like this is that according to the six-month ensemble forecast created by the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School, an ice-free Arctic Ocean will not occur this year. They put out six months in advance and they're incredibly conservative from a scientific standpoint, which is what you might expect given that this was the same group of professors who incorrectly projected an ice free Arctic Ocean to occur in 2016, plus or minus three years. So they are being very conservative. Here's the data from Friday, yesterday. And as you can see, on September 17th of this year, we bottom out at 4.686, about 4.7 million square kilometers of ice floating on the Arctic Ocean. And you can also see that the forecast has been below the actual data shown here with the red dots, below those red dots, below the actual data for every date so far. So this is great news. And you can find this information. I would recommend that you track it this year, next year, and so on, because it will give you a good idea when an ice-free Arctic Ocean will occur, and therefore when we are likely to lose habitat for most, if not all, species on Earth. That's kind of grim. Henry G is a paleontologist, evolutionary biologist, and senior editor at Nature, and he concluded on November 30th, 2021, in a paper in Scientific American, and this was actually in the final line, if we're going to write about human extinction, we better start writing now. And the title, as you can see, is Humans Are Doomed to Go Extinct. That's very inconvenient. I'm not a fan. Moving on, then. The next question is, what is the aerosol masking effect? The aerosol masking effect results from industrial activity, as does planetary warming. So this is an interesting catch-22. Planetary warming 
results from greenhouse gases that trap heat. So once the once the radiation gets through the atmosphere, it can warm the soil and the buildings, thus the urban heat island effect, and the planet in general. And greenhouse gases trap that heat so that about 30% of it is held in the atmosphere and therefore cannot go back out into space. Obviously, this is a good thing for life on Earth. Without the greenhouse effect, we wouldn't have life on Earth. But the bad news is we are well beyond the point at which we can stop the greenhouse gas from having negative consequences. According to Professor James Hansen, which most of us know as being one of the founders of understanding climate change, the aerosols fall out of the atmosphere in about five days. And he has pointed this out in many presentations and in much of his writings as well. The cooling resulting from aerosol masking in total right now is 55% globally, including a, a lot of that being on land. This again is from the peer reviewed nature series. This is an open access peer reviewed journal. So you can actually find this paper by just pointing in these relatively few bits of information, June 15th, 2021, Nature Communications. If you do that at Google Scholar, for example, you'll find this paper right away. And here's the bottom line from the abstract of that paper. By accounting for sampling biases in previous research, the magnitude of, and here they're talking about the aerosol masking effect, increases by globally 133% over land and 33% over the ocean. 133% over land. Well, that's where most of us live, isn't it? So this is, a again, a cause for great concern since most of us live on land. And this will be a very, very rapid heating event transpiring over the course of a few days. Moving on then, does anthropogenic climate change pose an ex existential threat? And according to paid climate scientists, corporate media outlets, and government officials, anthropogenic climate change certainly does not pose an existential threat. However, abundant evidence indicates otherwise. Either a reduction in aerosol masking, which I just described, or the uncontrolled meltdown of some of the world's nuclear power facilities will cause additional planet heating sufficient to cause loss of habitat for human animals. Remember, we're animals too. Specifically, we're vertebrates and we're mammals, both of which are threatened, and we're, we're, we're losing many of those species on a very frequent basis already. What's the deal with the uncontrolled meltdown of the world's nuclear facilities and, and how that would affect the temperature? Well, first, to reiterate again from aerosol masking, it accounts for 133% over land and 55% increase in overall planetary heating. And this is important because the rate of environmental change is such a profound concern. And we're currently at a little over two degrees C above the 1750 baseline. Well, that 55% is gonna make us, take us to about 3.1 degrees, uh, according to James Hansen, in about five days, if it persists. According to a paper in Communications Earth and Environment, again, an open access paper published April 12th, 2021, the Toba supervolcano eruption caused severe tropical stratospheric ozone depletion. That's the title, and that's the point that they're trying to make. And the meltdown of nuclear facilities was, would also produce the same outcome. In fact, the 2021 film Finch, which I think was a brilliant description of loss of stratospheric ozone as a result of nuclear power plants melting down. Now, in the film, power plants melted down. They never mentioned that stratospheric ozone was being stripped away. They never mentioned that that's what was happening. 
also they would somebody would would put their hand or their arm out into the sun and it would burn within a matter of seconds actually it would probably take a few minutes not a few seconds but i'll attribute that to artistic license in any event loss of stratospheric ozone accelerates planetary overheating even the writers of this film knew that but i I've not seen a single paid climate scientist write about it at any time. In addition, there's there's this thing called the um, hmm, geez, things just slipped my mind. Okay, I'll move along. Here's a paper in Science Advances published on May 8th, 2020, called The Emergence of Heat and Humidity Too Severe for too Human Tolerance. And Colin Raymond, the lead author of this paper, indicates previous studies projected this would have happened decades from now, but this shows it's happening now. In other words, what we expected to happen decades from now is already going on. The, the phrase I was kind of trying to come up with was wet bulb temperature. And more recently, in the Journal of Applied Physiology, the so-called 35 degrees C wet bulb temperature doesn't hold up. For years, we've been told that 35 degrees C at 100% relative humidity would cause organ failure. And what this paper in Journal of Applied Physiology points out is that it would take considerably less than that for even young, healthy adults to survive happily. They started to experience organ failure at wet bulb temperatures significantly lower than 35 degrees C. This, again, is a, is a matter of considerable concern. When I was living in Belize in Central America, we were, I, I was working beside other carpenters and we were building structures. And these are people, unlike me, who had spent their entire lives banging nails with hammers and building buildings. And this was in 2018 through 2020. And people were already experiencing organ failure from high wet bulb. With eight Grammys with Art Garfunkel and another four as a solo artist. Solidifying his place in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Now, the 81-year-old icon is releasing- We're trying to get this guy out of here. Please mute yourself. It's a haunting record, and one that explores some of life's biggest questions. Yesterday's boy is gone. Driving through a darkness, search for your forgiveness. I'm trying to locate this guy to drop him. Probably have. Can you please mute everybody? I have. Uh, hoping the gates won't be closed before you're forgiven. It's that guy, Neil. N-E-A-L-E. One instrument. Neil. Neil. The content of the songs uh, caught me off guard. And it feels funny to be so dancing. I'm sorry I'm having trouble locating the guy. It's you wrestling with mortality. It's I'll get him, I'll get him, I'll get him. To me. The first one, let's just talk about the first, the first one. You wrestling with belief. belief. A conversation with. Okay, I'll get him. I, I think we got him. At least we're going to get him real quick. So bear with me for a minute, okay? Yeah, I just did. Are you still there, sir? Yes, yes. So, Go so. Ahead. In any event, this paper found that even young, healthy adults experienced adverse consequences as a result of wet bulb temperatures significantly lower than the number that people have believed for a long time would 
cause organ failure. So again, that's problematic for human animals. Again, we're in the midst of a mass extinction event. We're in the midst of abrupt and irreversible climate change. Burke and colleagues indicated that climates like those of the Pliocene will prevail as early as 2030 in the current era. That's not long from now and persist under climate stabilization scenarios. Now, the Pliocene was about two degrees warmer than it is right now. And that's two degrees Celsius. And 2030 is not far from now. Will pers pers climates like those of the Pliocene will prevail as soon as 2030. And this paper, this paper uses the representative concentration pathways of the IPCC, which ignore self-reinforcing feedback loops and also ignore the aerosol masking effect. So this is, again, a paper that only looks at a part of the story as it's unfolding. As I already indicated, the representative concentration pathways, again, relied upon here by Tresos and colleagues in Nature from about three years ago, that the abrupt exposure events will begin by before 2030. So again, I think human animals are in, are facing significantly difficult situation ahead. As Southwestern American writer Edward Abbey wrote, if the situation is hopeless, there's nothing to worry about. And I tend to share that concern. Hope after all is to cherish a desire with anticipation or to want something to happen or be true. That's from my Merriam-Webster online dictionary, to want something to happen or be true. I want a lot of things to happen. I want almost everything I've reported so far to not be true. But that doesn't make it so. Hope is no solution. In fact, Cactus Ed recognized that and indicated, indicated that action is the antidote to despair. So what matters for us as individuals and collectively, we have our to-do list. We are aware that we are going to die. Something I realized when I was 11 years old, and most people know that they are going to die when they're, by the time they're 12 years old. And then we sort of get caught up in life and, and we tend to forget that we are actually going to die. We, we live as if we're gonna live forever. And that sometimes doesn't work out that way. A couple of cartoons to indicate the kinds of things first on the upper left. Most people do not lie in their deathbed thinking I should have bought more crap. And what almost all of us do in this set of living arrangements is use the expectations of others as the bars we use to trap ourselves into a cage. How many times have you wanted to do something that was beyond societal norms, that was beyond what all your friends are doing? because it seemed like the right thing to do, but you didn't because everybody else didn't think it was the right thing to do. With respect to what we ought to do, Kurt Vonnegut, quoting his son, Mark, said, we're here to help each other through this, whatever this is. And then quoting his uncle, Alex said, we're here to fart around and don't let anybody tell you any different. I think we can do both of those things at the same time, almost all the time. At the community level, I would like to think that we can address racism, misogyny, homelessness, and other community level challenges that continue to persist in almost every city in this country and probably throughout the so-called first world. With respect to what we do as individuals, Nietzsche pointed out in his book, Twilight of the I Idols, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. So if you find some reason for your continued existence, and so far you must have, or you wouldn't be here today. If you can do that, then you can bear almost any how. For me personally, I'm a teacher. This is who I am. This is not merely what I do. This is who I am. 18 years after 
Mary, I'll, I'll use her, I'll, I'll call her Mary because that's her name. 18 years after she took my conservation biology class and I required students to complete a significant piece of art or literature as a major part of their grade. And every student in every class that, that I had do this screamed, went to my department head, screamed some more, yelled at me, yelled at everybody who would listen that this was not science. This was art, this was literature, this was not science. 18 years later, Mary had her significant piece of art or literature when I met with her in Florida. It was important enough that she held on to it all those years as a reminder of what matters. For me as a teacher, I used to spend a lot of my time doing public speaking two or three weeks out of every month, I would voluntarily speak about abrupt irreversible climate change to audiences that numbered from very few to in the 300 range. And I've also, along with my partner, created a workshop for people who have come to grips with the idea of human extinction in the relatively short term, and they want to think about how they're going to live in response to that situation. So we have created this workshop, and I used to travel all over the place carrying this message. Those days are behind me now. Again, as Nietzsche pointed out, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how, and this applies to you. I just described what I do in my life in response to the relatively short time we have on this most wonderful of planets. I can't tell you what to do. Even when I was teaching classes, I never told my students what to do. But I would encourage you to find a why to live, because having done so, I think your life will become much easier. And I would happily turn this over to somebody else at this point. And I'm gonna to try to figure out again, how to unshare my screen. Okay. All right, are you about ready to finish up there, sir? I am finished up, I'm ready to take questions. All right, sorry, I just had to leave the room for a minute. All right. Uh, all right, you got, most of you guys know the procedures. For those of you who are new, I'm gonna tell you briefly, we're gonna take some questions and answers for our speaker. And we just had some people join us late. Um, there will be a recording, I'll post it up tonight. Uh, we got people already online asking questions. We also do it live here. So the first one I'm gonna to give to is uh, Charlie. And then I think that's Jake. So Charlie, go ahead and ask your question. Yes, sir, uh, Dr. McPherson. Uh, the you began by discussing the temperature of the Arctic waters, and I don't want to oversimplify things, but isn't the one significant measure of all that are out there is the temperature? I believe would be the temperature of the oceans. Am I correct, or is that an oversimplification of? measuring climate change? Well, the temperature of the ocean is very important, yes. I wouldn't say it's the most important thing. I would say the most important thing is the rate of environmental change. And when we lose ice floating on the Arctic Ocean, the rate of environmental change will be exceptional, to say the least. And so that's what has me particularly concerned. Yes, the ocean temperature is of huge concern, and during an El Nino Southern Oscillation event, a lot of heat is released by the ocean into the atmosphere and therefore goes on to land where we live. So that's a cause for significant concern. It's the kind of thing that is being measured, not with nearly as good a precision as it could have, or nearly as many places around the globe, but as a species, we caught on to this whole idea of climate change relatively late and didn't take it seriously until quite recently. So I, I guess I'm not surprised 
that we're not taking all the measurements and we haven't been taking all the measurements we could have been for a long time. Okay, uh, uh, Jake, I think you're next and then Chris. Go ahead, Jake. I think you're the one on the phone there ending in 2935. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Jake. Uh, okay, good. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, can you repeat your, again your name and affiliation and um, name and affiliation and contact information that's number one. Number two, um, what do you mean by uh, um, what, what do you call what do you call it? Aer aerosol depletion? What was the term you named by aerosol? What does that mean? Yeah, aerosol masking. So at the same time, industrial activity produces those greenhouse gases we all know about. It also produces these tiny particles called aerosols. Those aerosols go yeah. up into the atmosphere and they block incoming sunlight. It's as if we're putting a bunch of beach umbrellas up or wow. tiny mirrors. And almost nobody knows about this, even though there have been more than two dozen peer-reviewed papers going back to 1929. Wow. It's, just, it's this information that, that seemingly never gets out to the public because it points out that the constant demands on the populace to conserve won't necessarily lead to the outcome we expect. In fact, if we all, if we turned off industrial activity today, within five years, the global average temperature would rise 55% and on land would rise 133% over the more than two degrees C it's at right now. So this is a this is a very, very important matter that almost nobody understands or knows about. And again, yeah, it, was, it, it was hidden from view and remains hidden from view for a long time. I didn't discover it until I read a paper by James Hansen and colleagues it came out in December 2011. So I probably read it in early 2012. So that was almost three years after I left campus life. So my affiliation and so on and how to contact me, again, I'm Guy McPherson. I'm Professor Emeritus at the University of Arizona. I was on campus for 20 years and I realized that it was overpopulation, it was, it was too many rich people. Yeah driving us to extinction. And when I realized that I was among those rich people, relatively speaking, I couldn't take it anymore. So I opted out. I retired with honors. That's what emeritus means. I had to negotiate for emeritus status because I was too young to retire. But they let me go at the age of 49. And I lived off grid for more than a decade. And then having discovered the aerosol masking effect and also the loss of stratospheric ozone when some of the world's nuclear facilities melt down, I learned about those things. And it occurred to me that I'm not doing any good by living off grid. One, oh, wow. I'm not setting an example that anybody is following. And two, it's making my life pretty unpleasant. Okay. okay. Jim. But, well, so, 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 wait, 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 wait. Excuse me. Just to repeat again, what is aerosol masking? What does it mean? So, at the same time, industrial activity produces those greenhouse gases. It also produces these tiny particles that go up into the upper atmosphere. That's a result of industrial activity. You see it oh. when you get behind a diesel truck and they take off after being at the stoplight and the black smoke that comes out. Those are aerosols. They go up into the atmosphere. They act as little mirrors that prevent the light coming through and striking and therefore warming the planet. Those are the aerosols that we've been warned about since 1929, at least. In period oh, okay. And when, when they drop out of, the, out of the atmosphere, as they will in about five days, according to Professor James Hansen, the, one of the true founders of our understanding of climate change, in five days, the, the planet will heat to a very high level in a very short period of time. So this is a cause for considerable concern. More about me, you can, you can email me at guy, 
dot r dot mcpherson that's m c p h e r s o n at gmail.com okay jake we got to move on now so uh chris you got the next question go ahead unmute chris chris you got to unmute yeah can you hear me now yes we can hear you now thanks charles uh dr mcpherson um I have a doctorate as well, but in a different area. But the uh, uh, I'm also a state officer uh, for the Sierra Club in uh, in Texas, and uh, I could use that uh, uh, to the uh, probably the chat at at one point, uh, so I could actually forward that to uh, uh, to our uh, engineers and scientists on our end. Uh, like to see uh, uh, if we could get a presentation from you. Um, so if that's possible at some point, uh, uh, Charles said uh, that somehow somebody get that into the chat so I can actually forward that. Uh, the other question I have. Um, before you move on, before you move on, what did you want to put in the chat? Uh, I need uh, a uh, contact uh, for you. Uh, okay. But yeah, that's, uh, I got your name, uh, and uh, but I'll need uh, some way for us to contact you uh, so that we can uh, uh, get folks on board to see if we can get a prime uh, a uh, a presentation from you, uh, and this will uh, this will start the, in here in Texas, uh, Austin, Texas, state capital. So, um, and uh, and I'll, I'll wait to see if uh, do you need a second for me to uh, wait to see if you can get that into the chat. I'm putting it there now. All right. Okay, I put in my email address and also my blog. My blog, you can find at guymcpherson.com and you can find my email address there without too much difficulty. Right, and, and can, uh, go ahead. And you can also find everything I've talked about in this presentation on my blog because I try to keep up on the information as it comes out. Perfect. Uh, also, um, one of the things that uh, has recently happened is that the uh, the Department of uh, Energy in, um, in in Washington D.C. has moved forward to uh, support um, water vapor, um, which is basically using hydrogen as fuel for uh, engines uh, throughout the entire country. Uh, do you have any comment about what that impact will be, since uh, water vapor is a uh, significant uh, greenhouse gas? Well, hydrogen is a carrier. It's not a source of fuel. It carries energy. So, and and the the amount of hydrogen necessary to, for example, power your car going down the road, you would have to have a tanker the size of the huge oil tankers, the 18 wheelers, just to get you from one hydrogen filling station to the next 100 miles or so. So again, hydrogen is a carrier. It's not a source of energy. So I, I'd be concerned about headed that direction. In fact, there's a book from, oh, it must be 2005 plus or minus a few years called The Hype About Hydrogen. And I would recommend that. All right. Uh Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, McPherson. Uh, sure. Thank you. Appreciate it. Charles, I think you got a hand up uh, uh, with a uh, by person by the name of Tanner. Yeah, Tanner, go ahead. Unmute yourself. Ask a question. All right, we had to, uh, I had to uh, use the Tanner, go ahead, your hands up. Yeah, can you hear me now? That. Yeah, Tanner, we can hear you. Sorry about the, the delay there. I had to, uh, Nature was calling for a minute or two, okay? So, Guy, I just want to let you know, I watch your YouTube channel um, a lot, and I frequent it, especially in the last six months I've been following you. Um, and I've been wondering, uh, Towards the beginning of the presentation, I said something in the comments. You said that we're already um, at two degrees. And I asked if that was because of the aerosol masking or if it was also because of the, the, um, 
we move the timeline back for the baseline of the um, of when we started when we when you know what I'm saying like the back from the 1850s to this and we moved it to the 1850s and the 1750s. Um, is there any other reasons that we could be at that high degree warming now? Oh, so I think you're breaking up a bit there, but I think the question is, are we at 2C because we've had some aerosols fall out of the atmosphere? Is that the question you're asking? No, like I was wondering why you would say that we are already at 2. I, I'm, I'm quoting renowned professor Andrew Weiglickson from his October 9th, 2020 book, The Event Horizon. And he quotes considerable literature in that book, which was published by Springer. So you go to page 31, which you can find online of the event horizon, and you find that he is indicating that we're above two already. Now, you'll have to dig beyond the abstract you can find online and track down a copy in the library or something to determine the literature that he cites to reach that conclusion but it's abundant. You know, it's not something that he just made up and it certainly isn't something that I just made up. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I wasn't claiming that you were making it up. I was wondering like, what are the things that he says add to that or make that up? We, the, the, it's primarily because of greenhouse gas forcing, forcing from greenhouse gases since the seven mid 1750s mid 1700s sorry okay um i'd like to move on now real quick i'd like to take the next question if you don't mind um do you see any hope out of this mess at all for us or not because you know i'm looking around and i'm seeing myself uh you know uh hey uh what can be done to stop this and do you have any thoughts on what it will take According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, perhaps the most scientifically conservative body in the history of the planet, we are in the midst of abrupt and irreversible climate change. I doubt there's anything that can be done about it. What we can do in our own lives is act decently. What we can do as communities is try to eliminate racism and misogyny and homelessness. What we can do as a society is try to shut down the nuclear power plants before a few of them melt down and strip away stratospheric ozone and therefore superheat the planet in a very short period of time. These are the things that we can do. I, I, I continue to support a project founded by a postdoctoral student at Harvard University, Ye Tao, and it's called the MIR Project, which you can find at M-E-E-R dot org. And, and the MIR Project, it's, it's a framework, and it starts with reflecting significant light back up into the atmosphere before it has an opportunity to warm the planet. I think had we started... 10 years ago, or even five years ago, the mere framework would have been a great idea. And maybe it's not too late. I think that we have to act as if it's not too late. We have to act as if we can still fix this. And that means supporting the, the mere project at M-E-E-R dot org. I'll put that into the chat. Mine is the same thing. You found the literature on aerosols and, and nuclear foam. Yeah. I, I, I didn't hear any of that. It was too quiet. Can you turn it up a little? Okay, hang on. I've got some cross talk again. I've got some cross talk. We'll just ask if you guys can mute, please. Mm -hmm. so three, three of those containers are better. Just a minute here, please. I'm going to have to. Neil's. Uh, nine pounds. Yeah. Damn it. Give me a minute, please. This is ridiculous. Sorry. Bear with me for a minute, please. We got to mute, mute somebody. Please mute yourself. We got some crosstalk happening, and uh, I'm trying to. Okay, here we go. 
All right. Um, we got the, another question, Dan. You're you're online, and then we'll go with Dan. If you're ready, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. I have a question. You say um, you say. I mean, working against racism and misogyny and homelessness is very good. What about th people like Extinction Rebellion or Extinction Scientists? Are you connected to those people at all? Do you see any hope in there? Uh, the CEO of Chase Bank was testifying at the, at the House and he told in re response to why not lower oil, oil loans. He said, that's what people need. That's what people want. So the people have to educate uh, government. Government isn't going to do anything, It'll do very little, if anything. Do you agree? Yes, absolutely. I agree. Um, with respect to Extinction Rebellion and the scientists affiliated with Extinction Rebellion, I support some of what they do, but not all. Encouraging young people to get thrown in jail purposely to act out so that you do get thrown in jail is perhaps the worst idea I've ever heard. Our lives are short. I don't care if you live to be 120 years old. At the end of those 120 years, you're going to think, man, that was pretty short. Most of us don't have that long. And you're going to get thrown in jail? I wouldn't encourage anybody to act illegally and they're thrown, therefore get thrown in jail. Right. Life is short. Live. Right. But don't live like that. Right. You know about Juliana versus United States, right? The court case? Mm, marginally. Yeah. You don't see much hope in that, right? Well, I think it's a I think taking things to through the legal system is a good idea. I'm I'm a huge fan of justice. Right. But I'm not a huge fan of violent acts that will get you thrown in jail because I think your life is already too short to spend any time in prison. I have not spent any time, well, I've spent many, many, many days in incarceration facilities when I was teaching in them, but not from the perspective of somebody locked up. It's not a pleasant place. Okay, uh, we got another one live, go ahead. Uh, Ty, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, this is Mike Lehman. Thank you for the presentation. You know, I'm not crazy about the word that Bernie Sanders and everybody else uses. I just can't hear you. Speak up a little bit. Uh, just speak up a little bit more. Go ahead. I'm not real crazy about the word existential <clears throat> because it's not a solid word it's just something that's like mysterious and i know bernie sanders and a lot of other climate people use it and i don't think it's descriptive enough of if this is a very serious situation which it sounds like it is um i'm kind of 50 50 with climate change all along i i, I think it's a concern um, but I think, you know, in America, like people don't even know how to spell it existential and they don't understand what it means. And, you know, that's why a guy like Trump gets elected because he's plain talking. Is there a question? What's your question? What's your question, Mike? Okay. Why are we, can we change the word existential one? And then my second question is. Why are there not reporting stations of temperatures around the globe? Like Chicago would be a perfect location to check year to year temperatures. And I try to do that. It doesn't seem like we get a lot of cold, cold weather. So I think, okay, so can we get rid of the word existential one and have a little more descriptive word? And then two, can we have Chicago as a reporting station for year-to-year -year temperatures, so we can track this. I mean, every year there, they, there's records of that. So, you know, why is that? Why do we have to check water in the Arctic? 
or in the okay. inner, you know, you know, it's too, it's not solid enough. In Chicago, we have every day, everybody knows the temperature. So can we track it? Chicago is a good place to have tracking of temperatures year to year, day to day, decades and decades. Okay. So why don't we have that? In a, in, why don't we have tracking? We've heard it. We heard your question. And, and, and can we get rid of the word existential? First of all, I'm not in charge of the dictionary, so I can't even comment on existential. Secondly, there are many weather stations administered by the National Weather Service in Chicago that are measuring daily temperatures and precipitation. It's the accumulation of those numbers that climate scientists have been using for more than 100 years to track what's going on. And in the early days, of course, all those weather stations were in cities where they were susceptible to the urban heat island effect, which causes nighttime temperatures to not go down as much as they would without all that concrete and asphalt. So measurements have been taken into account to come up with more reliable numbers than the raw numbers that are reported from places like Chicago and thousands of other places around the country by the National Weather Service. And you can easily find those for Chicago and any place else online. Yeah, but we need to have tracking that and reporting it. Okay, let's let's okay, uh, let's move on. Ernie, you haven't had a question yet. Ernie, unmute, you haven't had a question yet. I'll let you go next. Yeah, okay. Hi, thank you, Tim, and thank you, uh Dr. McPherson, um, I unfortunately didn't catch all of it because some things were going on here. But um, my question may be irrelevant if you're right that that uh, you know we can't uh, uh, we're doomed. Uh, maybe maybe that's not exactly what you're trying to say. But what my question is historically and for the future, what effect does uh, the the massive population increase? that we're experiencing have in, in all, all the people who are using all of these resources in greater and greater numbers uh, as, as time goes on and we have more and more uh, offspring. You know, Paul Ehrlich wrote at the MOB blog several years ago, MOB is M-A-H-B, Millennium Assessment for Humanity on the Biosphere. And you can look on the MOB blog for a paper that he titled, Too Many Rich People. And that's basically the bottom line. He, he then went on to write several paragraphs, all of which pointed to, it's not the poor people on the planet who are causing overheating, who are causing the horrors of misogyny and racism and so forth. That's the rich people. And by rich people, he's talking about people like us who have laptops and can afford to participate in this conversation. I, you know, it's it's a tough thing to reverse, given that we're all born into the set of living arrangements, born into captivity, according to my friend, Timothy Scott Bennett. So how do we reverse that? It, it's tough. And, and that's why I showed that slide that indicated that that other people are handing us the bars, their expectations, and we're using those bars to build a cage around ourselves. We're using the expectations of others to trap ourselves into a certain way of living. Can we do better? Of course. Will we? Well, it's been a tough battle so far, and you don't find very many people who are, are trying to jump off the bucking horse. Okay, um, now we've got a question, go ahead. Mel, you, you're up. Mel Cadenas? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Very McPherson, much. do you hear me, guys? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. McPherson, um, pleasure to have you, uh, this opportunity. I have a question for you, troubling as it is. Um, have you done any research regarding um, the latest year? possible for us to live on earth in its current uh, direction as a species uh, whether in a business as usual model 
or under some sort of reform economically and uh, climate reform, climate change reform? Well, I indicated the paper in, in, proceeds uh, the National Academy of Sciences, indicating that we can expect to be entering the Pliocene as early as 2030. And that paper took, used the representative concentration pathways and therefore ignored self-reinforcing feedback loops and also ignored global dimming or the aerosol masking effect. So I strongly suspect it could be before, before then. Now, I'm, I'm personally, I'm stunned that James Anderson, the Harvard atmospheric scientist, famous for discovering the link between the emission of chlorofluorocarbons and the growth of the Antarctic ozone hole, he concluded, and, and here's the quote he, it, that, that you can find in Forbes after a presentation in Chicago. This was published in Forbes on January 15th, 2018. And Anderson said, quote, the chance there will be permanent ice in the Arctic after 2022 is essentially zero, end quote. So I'm stunned we made it this long. Okay. Um, I strongly any indication that, that it might go, say, at the end of the century? I strongly suspect that we're going to have an ice-free Arctic next year or the year after that. In the wake of that, we're going to lose habitat for our species and rapidly most if not all life on earth. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think we have until the end of the century. I think that's insane to even propose that idea as the IPCC does on a regular basis. Even 2050 mm -hmm. seems like a joke to me and not a good joke. It, I, I'd be stunned if we made it to 2030 as a result of the literature that I've seen and the rapid rate of environmental change is already underway and it's predicted to be much faster in the wake of an ice-free Arctic Ocean. And therefore, coercion makes no sense at the hands of, say, the Security Council, as Professor Johan Rockstrom indicated in Breaking Boundaries on Netflix with David Attenborough. Would you say? Yeah. You know, it's pretty interesting. I have a friend I haven't met yet, and she's a personal assistant for a billionaire in Switzerland. And when that billionaire whose name I don't know, or trust me, I would let you know, when he flies anywhere, and he flies a lot in his personal jet, he uses two personal jets, one to fly in front of the one he's in. That way, if there's any turbulence, the jet he's in can go around. We wouldn't want him to get an upset stomach. People who tell you that you need to conserve are not taking into account the aerosol masking being retained by billionaires such as this. I mean, this is one billionaire who's probably using more fossil fuels in a year than everybody in this Zoom does in 10 years. Okay, uh, Terry B, we, okay, go, go ahead, you get your question, it's, then we'll get to Terry yeah. B. Yes, right. hello, thank you. Um, I, I would preface it with a, uh, a statement to the effect that this is very old news. Uh, I was hearing intense news about uh, potential climate change about 30 years ago. I would recommend everybody do a Google for Art Bell, now deceased, who used to run a, a talk show called Coast to Coast AM. His podcasts are still available and they're prescient. My question is, have you heard of chemtrails? And if you have, uh, what effect do you think they might have on climate change and could they possibly being, could they possibly be being, uh, done by the government. I'm a scientist, so I don't talk about chemtrails because that's nonsense, not science. Uh, I'm sorry, I must disagree. Okay. Uh, in Chicago and in many cities, if you happen to look up, 
from your cell phone, uh, you'll notice streaks in the sky. Uh, normally, contrails from yes, yes, planes. those are those are contrails. The, the, yeah, contrails disperse. Chemtrails do not; uh, they spread. You know when when you when you can send me a peer-reviewed journal article that indicates with great certainty that these chemtrails actually exist, then I might be willing uh, this to is, I'm serious. sorry, this is this is 30 year old news. Okay, Any, anyway, uh, we wanna move on to our next questioner. Charlie, I know you're up, Jake, I know you're up. I'll allow you guys in a minute after we get to after Ellen's question. Go ahead, Ellen. Okay, hi, um, I had a couple questions. One is I'd like you to, um, repeat like what are the two like it seemed like you were saying that IPCC and one other source what were the main sources you were using for this presentation or okay if you can answer that question first what, what sources are you using I'm using peer-reviewed literature and occasionally the individuals who produce the papers for example James Anderson at Harvard and Jennifer McKinnon at the University of California San Diego. But okay. mostly I'm using peer reviewed papers and occasionally the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which relies completely upon peer reviewed papers for their work. Those are my sources. Okay. Um, okay. And um, so if I'm understanding you correctly, you are saying that you don't think it's possible for us to reverse um, climate change. Um, you don't, you don't think there's some kind of geoengineering fix or that if we, um, severely cut back on carbon emissions, which I admittedly don't think is likely going to happen anytime, um, soon at all. Um, and I'm wondering kind of on the vein of what, um, the, the questioner a couple of questions ago asked, how you my understanding is what you're saying is that once if these aerosols or whatever it was, um, you know, um, cause this problem that we only have like five years or so and that the temperature is gonna raise dramatically. Um, and yeah, well, that's my understanding if you could correct me if I'm wrong and how long once this happens, this event where things start climbing out, when do you think that's going to happen? And do you think we have like five years left or six years or 30 years? Um, and um, yeah, that's, that's a question. Okay, go ahead. It's already happening. It hasn't happened to you. It hasn't happened to somebody you know, but it's already happening. According to the peer-reviewed literature, and I'm sorry, I don't have the paper here in front of me, but if you go to an essay uh, at guymcpherson.com titled Extinction Foretold, Extinction Ignored, you'll find a paper, a peer-reviewed paper, indicating that 5.1 million people die every year as a result of, quote, non-optimal temperatures. Those non-optimal temperatures, for the most part, are a result of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. It's 5.1 million people. The fact that you haven't felt the impact of ongoing, abrupt, irreversible climate change does not mean that other people aren't feeling it. People are dying by the many thousands. It's already underway. We are in the midst of abrupt, irreversible climate change as reported even by the unbelievably scientifically conservative Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I don't know when. I get asked this every day. Most people, when they ask, when are we going to die? They want to know, when am I going to die? And I don't know. It's difficult for me to predict your, your death, much less the death of, death of everybody on the planet. But we will be out of habitat in the not too distant future. And again, I'm not going to put a, a name on that. Thanks for including the link in the chat to Extinction Foretold, Extinction Ignored, the short video version. Um, that was from CB. So. I don't know when you're going to die, and I don't know when I'm going to die. I think it'd be really cool if all of us had 
had had it stamped on our forehead at birth, our death date, and we couldn't see it, but everybody else could. Oh. And that way, if it was like 10 minutes from now, I know to walk away from you instead of having conversation because you might get hit by lightning. lightning. But there's, you know, there are things we don't know. I think we should act like decent people regardless. And that, and that means at the individual level, at the community level, and at the societal level. And we all know people who aren't acting that way. Most of them have interrupted this Zoom already tonight. Okay, I'd like to... Uh... Uh, Charles, uh, this is Chris. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Ron has been holding his hand up, but I don't think he knows how to use that. Uh, I that, know, uh, one more quick question. And that is, um, have I heard um, it speculated at some point that... Um, I'm going to add two questions. Um, the changes in the deep currents of the oceans, and that could actually cause an ice age. I was just wondering if you were going to think about that. Yes, of course. I hear that kind of um, thing on a very regular basis. And yes, the AMOC, as okay. it's called, the Atlantic Meridional Ocean Circulation, is in the midst of slowing. Will it slow in time to compensate for a rapidly overheating earth it would surprise me very much okay again again i continue to support the mirror project at meer.org even though the number of physical mirrors that would need to be placed to stabilize temperature where it is now to stabilize it to prevent it from going up any further would cover the continental united states so that's a fairly significant number of mirrors. I'm not sure there's enough sand on the planet to produce that number of mirrors. But I think that's our path forward. That's the only way that I've seen moving forward in a positive manner, that and changing our lives to a very de great degree. And that's why it's called the mirror reflection framework because the physical mirrors are just one among many strategies we have to participate in collectively. Okay, Ron, I know you've been waiting, so go ahead and ask your question. Ron. You yes, there? yes, I can hear you. Uh, one thing in the presentation that I noticed fairly early that uh, wasn't discussed is the role of cloud cover in the effect, effect of climate and climate change. And the biggest effects on that come from the galactic radiation and the so solar radiation and that combination. Um, so one, I was, Part of the question is whether you're actually familiar with uh, Lars, uh, Lars Svensmark, I think it is from uh, Sweden, who's done extensive work on that. Uh, we're also dealing with in these various gases of nitrogen is 71% is, uh, of the atmosphere and oxygen is 28. Well, then we got 1% left. And like the big presentation around carbon dioxide being the uh, the poison that it's supposed to be. That's one per 4% of the last 1%. So when you're dealing with these kinds of things, first of all, the question of the, the uh, cloud cover and the effect of that and the actual fact that Lars has actually replicated that in, in laboratories. And then the, um, the other thing is in light of uh, what you've been stating here and all these experts and whatever, since you've mentioned a number of people from Princeton, uh, has there ever been a public discussion in public or a debate with, uh, say, William Happer, who disagrees with your uh, computer models, saying that they're based on pre preconceived assumptions? So do you, first of all, I know you know Happer. So those two questions, what, are, what is the role of cl cloud cover and the, uh, the formation of clouds? And secondly, why not this public debate? I've written about cloud cover. I think it was at my essay called Climate Change Summary, which you can find again at guymcurson.com. And it's one of the, I think it's posted right on top of the page called Climate Change Summary. And you scroll through there or use the search box, you'll be able to find information about cloud cover and its importance. Okay. Yeah, but what he says is that it, it totally dominates any man created uh, effect. Well, he's absolutely wrong about that. And we have that debate in public. Okay, um, guys, I, I let me, please, let, please let me answer that question. I'm, I'm glad to debate any idiot such as that in public. <laughs> it it like, is huh? never going Tapper? to happen. Tapper? Next, next. 
Okay, um, now, Charlie and, and uh, Jake, you guys already had a question. We got one more person, Julie, who hasn't asked a question. We're gonna cut off our question period after this last question, Julie. Go ahead, Charlie and Jake, I'm sorry, but we're running out of time. We wanna get the rebuttals. Remember, we will continue to Zoom call afterwards. So Julie, go ahead and ask okay. your question. Okay, thanks, Charles. Um, yeah, real quick, given the, the time is short here, I was just wondering, um, Mr. McDonald, if you are familiar with, or Mr. McPherson, I'm sorry, uh, if if you're familiar with Cuba's state uh, policy to uh, um, to confront climate change, it was a plan that was initiated back in 2017 and deals with reforestation, um, protection of coral reef beaches, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but so I, I kind of feel like the dire nature of what's going on with climate change, collaboration globally is indicated. And so I'm wondering if you're familiar at all. Um, and I know it's difficult just because of US-Cuba relations and US uh, sanctions that are make, make uh, relations a little bit more challenging. But if you have any opinion about or... That's about that. I'd appreciate it to hear. It's, it's unfortunate that Cuba is small and populated by relatively few people. The actions they took during the so-called special period after the Soviet Union collapsed and the actions they continue to take in light of climate change are truly revolutionary. They turn their education system education upside system. down so that it focused only on public health and okay. huh. I used to be able to keep track of these things in my beady little brain. Um, in any event, they focus on what really matters. And, th and this is this shows the importance of having a benevolent dictator that you can change the public ed education system essentially overnight. And now Cuba has among the best among the best medical doctors in the world if, if you're in an emer if you're in the midst of a planetary emergency the people you want to turn to are cuban doctors a, a good friend of mine had his life extended considerably by a cuban doctor when he broke his neck working on a project in madagascar okay at this point we're going to go to rebuttals i'm going to give everybody three minutes whether it be online or here we got, I'm sure we got a lot of opinions to go through it. So, uh, you know, the microphone's yours. Um, let's thank our speaker. Yeah, let's thank our speaker. All right, who's got rebuttals? Raise your hands. I'm trying to leave some time in for you guys to chime in as we go on. Okay, Mel, you got three minutes. Go ahead. And then Charlie will get you next. Three minutes you said for me? Well, uh, roughly. Three minutes or so we're going to try to do it because we got a lot of people want to speak okay um, uh is it okay if i ask questions and continue that uh right now we're in the rebuttal period which means you get the sound off on um on what's happening if you want to okay I'd, I'd rather i could do that too thank you i'd rather just go right now because we had a formal we had our our presentation we had okay to the speakers we have to be out of here by 8.45 at the restaurant, but that doesn't mean okay. 45 and that means we have to be, we can continue the conversation on Zoom afterwards, because I'm sure there'll be a lot for you guys. All but, right. Okay. All right. Um, ahead, thank you. Uh, well, based on what Professor McPherson has uh, so kindly and patiently offered us, uh, all his information, it seems that, um, yeah, we're we're clutching at straws. Um, hope is uh, hope is of essence, of course. We have to act as if, um, you know, there is hope, and we can do something about it. Although it may seem otherwise, um, I feel personally that I know Professor McPherson said. I know Professor McPherson said that um, the upper class is somehow responsible for what we're in. Uh, he's true about that uh, to the degree that the upper class was really a hundred years ago's middle class. So 
I feel like from my extensive study of history, I don't have a degree, but uh, it's been a it's been a long time hobby of mine. I listen to so many videos and uh, read research for fun all the time. It seems to me that it's just the middle class. Um, that's the culprit. Um, and I'm not pointing any fingers. I'm a member of the same class. Uh, we consume the most. We are complacent. We're innovative. Uh, we sanitize reality. Uh, we, in other words, we avoid the hard truth uh, in the world that you have to take something from Earth in order to live. We avoid that truth. So we've come to a head now. Um, the, the goals of the United Nations, who, who can find fault with those? At that, even at that level, um, I think we have turned a blind eye to the natural um, biosphere we live in, ecology. Uh, so what we've come to now is, you know, a state of bad management. And uh, we would have to use a miracle dystopian coercion or something uh, at the global level to reverse this trend, but it doesn't seem like we will just because of the problems of the tragedy of the commons, global competition, um, real politic. What we see in Russia and Ukraine is a part of this geopolitical struggle to secure resources for millions upon millions of people. All right, wrap it up, please. So yeah, just to wrap it up, um, if Professor McPherson has a response to any of that, I would very much appreciate it. I am a follower of his. I follow his research closely. Right. So, You'll and- the last word tonight when we stow up. Okay, uh, I'm going yeah, to- go, thank you. I'm going to go to Bill and then I'm going to go to Charlie. Right. So Mike, I'm sorry, Mike, I'm going to go to Mike who's live at Dappers and then Charlie, go ahead. So Mike, uh, make your rebuttal. You got three minutes. Mike from the other side. Go ahead, Bill. We'll get you, we'll we'll get you a little later. <laughs> go ahead. Okay, can you guys hear me? No. All right. Okay, so yeah, I don't like this existential word. I think it sucks for climate change. Anyway, how about try this one? Air pollution is climate change, and climate change is air pollution, and vice versa. Go with that. It's, it's more hard hitting. This existential and egghead, you know, descriptions. Half of America can't even understand that stuff. All right, so what the hell does racism have to do with climate change? Go figure that out. I know the poor do live sustainably, like people in Africa, South America, you know, poor regions of the world, they don't burn a lot of jet fuel and gasoline and coal and all that stuff that causes pollution. But I don't know what racism is. I mean, all kinds of people are racist. Blue, black, white, gray, brown, red. You know, not just white people that are racist, by the way. Okay, so <clears throat> I still think you have to have one location. Maybe downtown Chicago is not a good spot, but somewhere where it's away from the Great Lakes that has extremes, maybe Minneapolis or Quad Cities. And you can you know, compare that year to year, the highs and the lows over decades and see what you know, we have real tangible scientific evidence of how the temperature has been changing year to year. Not waters and certain oceans and thicknesses of ice, which are, you know, subjective as they say. Oh, by the way, contrails are air pollution. So just remember when you see pretty airplanes and jets going overhead, that's air pollution. No question. And it's water vapor, which I think affects climate change, if I understand correctly. Um, one last thing here about the credibility of climate change. Um, you know, when you guys give deadlines, like in five years, we're going to die, or it's going to be a thousand degrees in eight years or when Al Gore makes all these claims and they don't come to fruition, and then this and that and temperature, this is the stuff that makes me really skeptical and that's why I'm 50-50 on climate change. 
you know, you guys give the deadlines, the hypotheticals, and we're supposed to go, oh, we're going to die in five years from climate change, and then it doesn't happen, and we're all disappointed. Okay, Mike. I just wanted to see if you were paying attention. All right. One last thing. Don't trust American media ever, especially stuff out of New York City. Too many lies. We got fake news. We got Trump out of New York City. Get out. New York City. Get what? the rope. Get the rope. <laughs> as, they say, as they say in that commercial. New York, New York City. Don't trust Get the rope. All right, Charlie, you're next. You're next, Charlie. Yeah. All right, Charlie, you're next. Go ahead. All right. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. McPherson for a nice summary of the current issues affecting uh, uh, global warming and in its myriad of areas. And thank you for the references, which I hope everyone will look at. I'll be eclectic as usual here. Uh, first of all, I gave a lecture on the history of food and agriculture. And you did mention the effect of uh, heat stress on animals. Uh, and you are correct, we, we presently consume uh, three grains, it uh, constitutes most of our diet. However, we're, there's about 100 to 200 plants that humans consume. I was often curious if the agricultural community is developing seeds that are resistant to some of the changes in climate. It's possible to change crops uh, 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 to deal with that situation. Now, the other thing is, you mentioned the effect of heat stress on living animal species. Um, at present, the humans consume about 14 species of animals. And the way I perceive it, uh, we're pretty much going to have to rely on a plant-based diet. Uh, these 14 species are not likely to be adaptable, such as plants, to changes in the climate. So those of you who are a vegan persuasion, I think that's going to be the case, that we're going to have to have greater reliance on plant-based uh, sources of food. Um, regarding airplanes, we've had lectures on this. Airplane, every airplane produces particulate matter equal to all the leaves of grass on earth. So yes, however, I'm not going to embrace any of the conspiracy theories, which we've heard over and over again here at the college. Unfortunately, I am a subscriber to Coast to Coast. Uh, the Coast to Coast has basically taken a position. Uh, if you follow them, I. Uh, they're, they're climate deniers, climate change deniers, unfortunately, uh, regardless of their position on chemtrails. But yes, airplanes have no pollution standards to which they ascribe. Um, and transportation, of course, is 97% reliable on fossil fuels uh, right at present. Uh, though, of course, we're undergoing a transition. Anyhow, thank you again, Dr. McPherson. Please come again. Uh, when you seek to up to bring us an update on the situation. Thank you, sir. All right, David, go ahead next. You're next. Yes, I would like to address myself to some comments that were made earlier. First of all, microphone Al Gore says or does not say. And regardless of what deadlines we hear or do not hear about, we should not use that as an excuse to avoid doing anything about global warming. It's, we're overdue for that, and it should have been done years ago. That's number one. Number two, what does racism, you ask, have to do with, with climate change? Well, let me put it this way. Where do you think they are putting all the, all the toxic chemical plants, all the toxic steel mills and everything else? They're putting, they're putting them in the same neighborhood that all the poor people and all the people of color live in. Look what happened when they located General, when General Iron left Lincoln Park and it moved to the south side. Look what happened when they demolished those, those chimneys and dust <laughs> spread all over the south side. So I'm sorry, some, some things need to be done about that. Finally, as to the idea of, of debt spending pollution, 
I saw a recent movie that was made in 1968, a Douglas PCA jet. This is one of the early jets. Modern jets still believe that they put out less than that PCA was putting out. You can see the filth coming out of the engines on that thing. Oh, just cover it up. So, well, that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> all right, we got a lot more rebutters, you guys, from the chat, from the chat. <laughs> All right, uh, can you hand the microphone to Sid, please? Yeah. We're going to get Sid next. And then we'll, uh, yeah, priority to the entrance. All right, well, uh, Mike, can you move yourself so we can see Sid? Oh, sure. David, you were talking about air balloons and not climate change. <laughs> All right, we're getting, uh, we're getting the mic. Okay, we're going to get Sid next. Okay, Sid, you got it. You got three minutes. Yeah. So, um, uh, people, if you if you listen to the news lately, um, the Russians have, are putting nuclear weapons in Belarus. But what you don't hear is the United States and NATO are going to hold war games in Germany with NATO. And that's a provocative act. That came first before the Russians said they're going to put nuclear weapons in Belarus. But the news does not tell you that. It's a stark thing. And you don't know the truth when you actually listen to it. Because the important part, they leave out. They don't talk about it. Another thing is that um, in 1980, when Reagan was elected president, the, the, the uh, government made an announcement that they use that they'll use a first strike against anybody they think will invade them. And that policy still exists. And they don't tell you that if we use atomic weapons and a lot of all the all the um, honest scientists will tell you that. You're going to have nuclear winter where nothing will be able to grow and it'll go off the whole population of the earth. What would happen in Canada with all those forests burning? New York City, they couldn't even see each other walking down the street. That's how bad it's got. And if two sides are new, using nuclear weapons, you'll have nuclear winter where nothing will grow. All right. Um, okay, go, go ahead and get, we're going to get this next okay. guy. Okay. I'll go ahead. Uh, I've been keeping the journal for many years. This goes back 40 years. Father. And there was a. Here, here you. We'll get them up. Go ahead. Go okay. ahead. Uh, 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 a book called You Can Have It All. As I thought about this, I said, wait a minute. They're appealing to ego. We have egos. That all microphone all doesn't all work, Tim. It, would, it works if he would talk louder enough. So tape it down, Charlie. I've got to volume up. Okay. Why don't we have that other microphone? Charles, we lost the uh, we lost the picture. It's uh, it's stopped. 
Yeah, I know. We just have to wait. Does, does Tim know? I believe so. Okay. By the way, Ernie, uh, you should put an X over your thing. Okay. Oh, you want me to do it now? Well, you kept showing up before. I'm sorry. You want me to mute? I'll mute. Yeah. Uh, Dr. McPherson, thank you for your, your patience. It's appreciated. <laughs> I was on campus for many years. Yeah. You too. haven't even begun to test my patience. <laughs> That's true. Since we haven't heard, I, I left out the thing. I and my pals, we put together something, a group called the Chicago Greens in the late 70s. And of course, EPA began in 71, but climate change was the topic back then. Right? There were articles in Scientific American that one regular author produced a video even on life under global warming. This is not a new concept. Uh, while we're waiting, uh, Dr. McPherson has the, uh, uh, have you have a, a concern about how large that uh, that ozone layers occurred in in, the, in Antarctica? Interestingly, the ozone hole is now of primary concern over the Arctic, not the Antarctic. And ozone holes have been popping up all over the planet for the last 10 years or so. So we, we did manage through reduction in use of chlorofluorocarbons, we did manage to stop the increasing size of the Antarctic ozone hole. It has stabilized at the point it was 30 years ago. But there's, our problems are many to say the least. I hardly know where to begin. Okay, I'm sorry about that. We lost connection at the restaurant here for a little bit. And I think we were talking with Ellen. A guy will we'll get you again at the last word about maybe another 20 minutes or so. But, uh, but Andy's going to go next. So go ahead, Andy. Or right, you got about three minutes or so, Andy. Wait till I get you on camera there. Thank you for the speech. Um, I gave a talk on censored news last week, and as far as I can tell, this concept that he's talking about tonight is one of the top 10 censored things in America. Of the normal news sites that talk about what's happening, reality, I've never heard a scrap anywhere on the media, the alternate media or mainstream media of what Dr. McPherson was talking about tonight. That's one thing. <clears throat> Another thing is, I think Dr. McPherson overlooked, because it's easy to overlook because it's blacked out, that there are some other people that we could get help with. And that's the other four civilizations we share the planet with. The files are being opened now, and they're reporting where the bases are of other races that have been sharing our planet with us for thousands of years. And the reason, one of the reasons that's been covered up is that the transportation they have doesn't use coal, oil, nuclear, or fossil fuels or anything like that. Our whole multi-trillion dollar fossil fuel industry would become, and the nuclear power industry also would become obsolete overnight if we were given the technology that is used to propel these machines that are called UFOs. In the water, they're called underwater unidentified objects our Navy's been tracking them with sonar since 1972. So some of these things can go 150 miles an hour underwater down to 20,000 feet. And then when they come out of the water up near a ship, ship's captains have been reporting these things coming out of the water around ships and then flying off at 3,000 miles an hour. For the, for the few hundred years that we've had sailing ships going across the deep oceans. So there's a whole body of aircraft out there they, they could instantly use the technology they have to seed our atmosphere with particles to reflect the sunlight. 
if we were able to ask them for help. And they have been shepherding us through the nuclear age, keeping uh, Russians and us from having an accidental nuclear war. There's many different instances of UFOs hovering over missile silos and shining a blue light down in them and disabling the nuclear warheads when things got tense. That's been going on since 1945. All kinds of UFO activity has increased a hundredfold since 1945, since we exploded that first bomb, atomic bomb out of Alan Krill in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. When the human race entered the atomic age with the ability to destroy the planet through nuclear war and everything else, we've been getting help with the grace of God from any one of these other four civilizations that our CIA has been tracking since 1988. So I don't share the view that humanity is just doomed and we should just find a comfortable hobby or something to, to do for our last years and think positive. I side with the kids led by Greta Thunberg and the other young people that are out of school on Fridays in the millions now protesting the future that we, we can do something. Incidentally, in the news today, uh, it's Texas. <clears throat> the state of Texas is getting help. They're not having blackouts and brownouts like they used to in the bad weather because of solar power that's gone up exponentially. The solar and wind power are keeping uh, air conditioners and power running in Texas. So uh, if you haven't done any studies on solar in the last 10 years, you wouldn't know that solar energy has dropped 95% in price and it's spreading worldwide at an exponential rate. We can get off fossil fuels with the, with the Manhattan Project, where you know, the human race could pretty much get off fossil fuels 50, 60, 70% by 2030. But then we, we can move on. And if we get help from one, one or two of these other civilizations, uh, the human race can enter into a brighter future. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Emma, you're next. Please go ahead and uh... I'll lower your hand. You got three minutes to uh, say your piece. Thank you, um, Dr. McPherson. Um, what? What? I'm I'm really curious about if you really believe some of the claims that you make because they're. I mean, most of what you say is really great science, and then you say something that attracts all of these crackpots on this call, like that you know we're going to be extinct by the year 2030. And I'm just wondering if you say things like that, like, I don't know, just to kind of exaggerate a basic general truth, or if you really believe it, because I mean, it, it really invalidates most of your message. You, you attract crackpots and crazy people who end up talking about things like UFOs and QAnon. And I'm just wondering why you say things like that. This isn't a question. This is not a question period. Well, we know that, Charlie, but there's still some people here who uh, are new to the college and are not with the format. If, if our um, author wants to answer that, go ahead. If our speaker wants to answer that, go ahead. But he will he will get an opportunity to get the last word. OK, who else is rebutting tonight? We still got about maybe uh, 15 minutes or so to entertain more rebuttals. I know a lot of you guys have been active on the chat. So uh, if you're ready, go ahead. All right, I'm gonna do mine then. You wanna go say something? I'll say something. All right, since you were cut off, you wanna go ahead and get up there and let's get your, get your rebuttal. All right, Ellen's gonna go next and then I'm gonna get mine. This is it here? Yeah, right up front. Let's make sure that you Right. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. This is Ellen Corley, and uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, what I said was, um, I was just telling Andy that uh, you know I what? I have I may have developed yeah. almost a defense mechanism of thinking that you know his idea of you know unidentified flying objects can help us with this crisis or you know, that we're just gonna die in 2030. My defense mechanism is to not believe any of them. You know, I wanna hear I'm just both sides. I wish I could hear a debate, you know, because 
I mean, I grew up with climate deniers. Um, my stepfather was Ayn Rand, right wing capitalist, um, you know, and then all my friends are Democrats, believe in global warming. And, and I, you know, so I basically believe them, but uh, I think the solution lies in a education system and a, we need to have the dialectic so that we, we get to, everybody's got to be on board, mainly the, the businesses. It's a supply side problem. If they don't believe it, nothing's going to change. You know, they want war, we'll have war. If, uh, you know, so they say, well, you know, vote, but you have to have honest people like me in the, on the ballot, me and you and real people. Right now, we, they put in, you know, they're picked by the billionaires, the Koch brothers, the, you know, the oil lobby. And um, so we're, we will die soon, <laughs> probably. But, you know, I just, all I can hope is that I used to worry about nuclear war as, you know, it's very plausible or biological war, these vaccines killing everybody. But you just keep researching into it like scientists and, um, you know, with the vaccines, it turns out they really were designed to kill biological warfare. You can't say that. We have to have a free debate on the internet. Anybody who says they kill you is removed, including me. And if it's coming out, you're, loony. you're, you're uh, wild. Millions of people have to do with climate change. Charlie censors all of us. And, uh, because he is with the FBI. You know, uh, we cannot have a government controlling free speech. You know, we can't have boomerang because they're a corporation or, or you know, Jeff Zuckerberg censoring our speech and our, our information, our understanding, our history of science. The key thing is we need social science and communication theory says that it's got to be free. It belongs to the people, the, the knowledge and, and media and broadcast. We need to restore the fairness doctrine, the Federal Communication Commission, honest services laws, but it basically there's been a coup d'etat, invisible, and right now they're not trying to that solve that any of our problems. You know, a government soon. without a, that is basically a invisible empire dictatorship will, will die. So that, I think focus on that first. That was my platform. I got pushed off the thing because the Israeli lobby basically controls it all and they, they want to keep us in forever war. At the CIA, the Mossad, the everyone's police. against you. Well, there is an invisible empire. Look at the genocide, and it's not the climate change. No one listens way of to distracting you. us from the real problem, which Charlie gets to pick. What is a real problem? All right, Charlie, you're acting just like our tools did. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, you're the host of the organization. It's hard. I had to cut you off at one point. But anyway. Now, I'm going to give my rebuttal to this, and I am very serious about this because I had too have been studying the effects of climate and pollution and uh, our trouble with fossil fuels since the mid-70s. And I remember a few, about 10 years ago, um, I encountered a solution to our problems, and I think most of the people in the college know this, but if you haven't heard about nuclear power and you're an environmentalist, I think you're crazy because I think it's going to take nuclear power to get us out of climate change. Now, I'd like to hear or see the research that our uh, gentleman, that our guy McPherson talks about with the aerosol effects of a nuclear meltdown. But how about we have reactors that can't melt down? How about we get reactors that don't do it? China just about last year started a program that we had in the 60s. It was called the Thorium Molten Salt Reactor. And what they did was basically, uh, was basically, um, you know, try a different way. One of the first advocates who was the um, inventor of the light water reactor, his name was, uh, he was a director at uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratories. And his name is escaping me right now, but he also was one of the first guys to start talking about climate change in the mid seventies. And he was also one of the guys who said, we're going to have to get off fossil fuels. Alvin Weinberg, thank you. And uh, because Alvin Weinberg was so concerned, he then developed and tested in the 1960s a different kind of reactor made on molten salts. One that can't melt down, one that uh, you have to keep going rather than waiting to get out in the world 
And, you know, it was tested for 6,000 hours in the 1960s. And they're kind of just forgotten about for a while because the, uh, the uh, administration wanted to go to a different kind of reactor that they shut down in 1978. Well, as recently as about the year 2005, these uh, papers that the government held in a uh, room at the uh, Children's Museum at Oak Ridge were rediscovered and a lot of them were put on CD and put on the internet. And they were all done by Alvin Weinberg. And all of a sudden, we, we had a second revolution in the Thorium Energy Alliance. There's a, we talked about this before at the College of Complexes, including uh, having the director, John Kutch, from the Thorium Energy Alliance website. And I myself have attended about four uh, conferences on it myself. The firm can confirm conclusion that we can solve this climate change problem by reducing our emissions, still maintaining an advanced industrial development by the implementation of centralized power from the thorium molten salt reactor. Anyway, I've said enough. Um, I know Guy's going to probably contradict me. We have time for a couple more rebuttals, so if you guys uh, want to do so, please go ahead from the room here. Um, um, all right, hang on a second. I'll get the two, two of you next. All right, uh, Mel, we're going to get you, and then we'll go to Dan and Alana. All right, Mel, go ahead. Thank you much. Um, I heard some of the responses. Um, it's it's a predicament. I've been saying this in the in the in the chat room. I've been texting actively. It's it's a subject that's occupied my time. I don't lose sleep over it, but we might reach a point where we might. Um, not to mention anything about uh, you know losing lives and loved ones uh, at some point. I'm not trying to spread fear. Uh, this does seem like a human problem. Um, you know, politics. Politics is part of the problem. We are a political animal, to quote Aristotle. Uh, but over politics is geopolitics. It's taken us a long time to know this through history, but all the trends that we see in politics are due to the bigger picture at work. The sky, the earth, in motion, causing changes, making us adapt. I actually descend from the first farmers in the world. I did a DNA test. Uh, so at the begin beginning of the Holocene, my ancestors, the Natufians, in uh, what is today Israel, invented agriculture, discovered it. Um, and here we are, 10,000 years later. So okay. the point here is, we, the problem of overshoot remains. Eight billion people on earth, they wanna live the American lifestyle. In order to do that, we need four earths. So we either reduce consumption or we reduce population. We can't reduce population because that's wrong. So we have to reduce consumption. But in order to reduce consumption, for eight billion people to live on one earth, according to Bill Reese's overshoot research, we would have to live the lifestyle of Ethiopia. Everyone in the world would have to live that lifestyle. Are we ready to do that? Probably not. Why? Because of politics. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Okay, Dan and Alana, you, Dan, you're next. Go ahead. Okay. So I see on Guy McPherson, your website, talking about the great dying. 90% of the species on earth died to due to a global average temperature rise about 250 million years ago. So obviously Earth re re was reborn. So nature, we people are part of nature, even though people think they control nature, but nature is part of people. And so Earth was reborn from 250 million years ago when 90% uh, of the species were gone. And maybe 10% of the species are gone now. I don't know, maybe you know the percentage. But uh, obviously Earth is gonna do fine without people around. And uh, so there's no worry about that. Now talking about, uh, uh, that's about all I got, thank you. Okay. Um... All right, uh, anybody else care to rebut? Otherwise, I'm gonna transfer it over to, to uh, our speaker to get the last word. So uh, Guy, when you're ready, why don't... All right, go ahead, go ahead, which one? 
All right, he's coming. We got one more rebuttal from the from the floor, and then we'll go to Guy to close this up for the night. So, so do not give in to despair. I know it looks bad, and I'll admit I don't know anything about climate science. But if it does look bad, like this is sounding, we just have to think big. We got to think about big concepts, like what I talked about one of the last times I was here at Georgism. Tax the destruction of land, tax pollution directly, tax the hoarding of land instead of taxing non destructive business activity. Don't tax production, tax destruction. Second idea is bioregionalism. Change our borders so that they're not east and west, north and south lines. We already have borders and nature gave us, they're called mountain ranges. And all the water between those mountain ranges flows into one place. It's easier for a government to track. You don't have to track into a neighboring jurisdiction if you have bioregionalism, so the borders are on the mountain ranges. And if an army comes from over the from over the mountain ranges, you can see them coming. So bioregionalism helps us save money. We don't have to create borders. It, it'll help us focus on the environment and on our water rights, and so will Georgia can help us focus on the land. We take those big steps, it's possible we can turn this around. Okay. Um all right. Uh Guy, you're you're up now. You got you got uh, about fifteen minutes or so to uh, take the last word. Uh, take it away. Thank you, thank you, everybody who participated and everybody who will see this on YouTube later. And it won't take me fifteen minutes or even five. Just take take your time, in other words. And what what we'll do is we'll keep the Zoom call open so you guys can continue to chat when we wrap things up. So go ahead and uh, take what you're taking. A couple of things to keep in mind. One, civilization is a heat engine, no matter how it's operated. Civilization is a heat engine. That's based on five peer-reviewed papers by Tim Garrett in Utah. And so in other words, it doesn't matter if we use solar panels or wind turbines. And to the person who asked if I was serious, if I actually believed what I was saying, of course I do. I'm a scientist. I have collated the work of other scientists to present my findings. But I didn't write the paper by Burke and colleagues in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, pointing out that we're headed for the Pliocene by 2030. I didn't write that paper. I just told you about it. That doesn't make me the bad person here. I want to finish with a brief statement that I've made perhaps hundreds, maybe thousands of times, because I'm asked every day for advice about living. In response, I recommend living where you feel most alive, and simultaneously where you feel most useful. I think this is really important because remaining useful to other human beings and to the living planet makes us feel good, makes us feel like we're doing something that is beneficial because it is. I recommend living fully. I recommend living with intention. I recommend living urgently with death in mind. I recommend the pursuit of excellence. I recommend the pursuit of love. In light of the short time remaining in your life and my own, I recommend all of the above, louder than before, more fully than you can imagine, to the limits of this very restrictive culture and beyond. For you, for me, for us, for here, for now. Now is what we have. Live large, be you, and bolder than you've ever been. Everybody else is taken. Live as though you're dying. The day draws near. And when I say live as though you're dying, I'm referring to how people actually live when they are in hospice. They live with incredible honesty. Your dying grandmother would never lie to you and she would catch any lie you told her. Let's live honestly. No lies of omission, no lies of commission. That's enough for me. Thank all you right. all. Thank you all for joining us. All right, we will keep the Zoom call open. This will be posted tonight. I'd like to thank all you guys for coming. So Dave, go ahead and close us out. First of all, let's thank our speaker for a stimulating and provocative presentation. Next week, Charlie Paydock, our coordinator, is gonna talk about 
What is it, 50 historical sites that you all should visit? I hope we have a working microphone by then. We do have a working microphone, Charlie. It's just- I've got one at the podium. Yes, you've got one right here. It's a piece podium. of junk. Yeah, I know. I know. At any rate, thank you all for coming and we'll see you next week. All right, Charlie, I'm gonna trans- I'm gonna trans- Wait a minute, I want a working microphone. I'm gonna transfer the uh, Zoom- uh, Charlie, go buy him one. Uh, he did. He, he won't use it. For we, are, we are using it, Charlie. Okay. I don't see it.